Americans are well aware of what it means to live in a highly partisan, polarized society. Partisanship shapes who we vote for and what political ideals we hold dear, but it also shapes so much more. Which kinds of communities we choose to live in, which experts we decide to believe, how we respond to national crises, even where we go to buy a cup of coffee. So partisanship shapes our political lives, but it also shapes our personal lives. And perhaps that's why I found this current period of partisan rancor to be oddly familiar. You could say that I grew up partisan with a father who embodied conservative ideology almost to the point of cliche. Donald Rumsfeld wrote his nomination into college. Once he got there, his classmates compared him to National Review founder William F. Buckley. A devotee of the Republican Party, my father received his MBA from the University of Chicago and made a career out of his faith in free market capitalism. Now, intellectually, I didn't understand all this as a kid, but I still felt partisanship as something that shaped my family's politics. You could call it a political sixth sense. At some point, maybe when I was around 10 years old, I decided that if politics, or at least the Republican Party, meant so much to my dad, perhaps I should understand it all a little bit better. So I asked him, what was the difference between Democrats and Republicans? He responded with a logic that was appropriate for my age, but not so much his. The Republicans are the good guys, and the Democrats are the bad guys. My mother was not amused. And still, I wanted to understand not so much why one political party was better than the other, but why political difference mattered like it did. And I was going to make my career out of that. And just as I was trying to figure out how to craft a research project around that question, the 2008 election of President Barack Obama opened up so many windows into how Americans are divided and why. For my part, I was struck by the stories of gun sales surging across the U.S., of ammo flying off the shelves of gun stores. And this was something that actually happened before Obama even stepped foot into the Oval Office. And it was a trend that would continue throughout his time as president, eventually earning him the nickname, America's Greatest Gun Salesman. Now, ironically, gun rights was one of the few, maybe the only defining conservative issues that my father wasn't particularly passionate about. I didn't grow up with guns, my family seemed to hardly care about gun politics in the 1990s, which would set the stage for what happened when President Barack Obama was elected. I would be in my mid-20s before I even fired a gun for the first time. And still, in 2008, gun politics fascinated me because I thought that it could help me better understand conservative politics. After all, conservative politics as a political platform, includes gun politics. Gun rights is one of its defining pillars. And this has increasingly been so since the 1970s. Political identification shapes whether someone owns a gun and what they think about a wide variety of gun policies and regulations, whether opposing them or supporting them. The typical American gun owner is a white conservative man. And yet, in a country where there are more guns than people and where roughly a third of American adults own a gun, that profile, no matter how statistically accurate it may be, threatened to conceal as much as it revealed. In 2008, alongside those stories of gun sales surging and ammo flying off the shelf, I heard a different kind of story, a different kind of narrative about groups that broke that mold of the typical gun owner, groups that carved out space for women who owned guns, African-American gun owners, gun-owning members of the LGBTQ community, even liberal gun owners. 
There had to be more to the politics of gun ownership than what a political party could define, even if it was absolutely the case that conservatives predominated among American gun owners. So over a decade ago, I began my journey to understand the many dimensions of guns in American life. Researching guns in America meant that I had to keep an open mind and an open heart to the many experiences that could illuminate how guns matter to the people they impact, whether for better or for worse. My research has brought me to firearms training classes and open carry protests. It's put me into conversation with gun sellers and public law enforcement. It's meant that I spend time talking to people like concealed gun carriers for whom guns play a positive role in their everyday lives. It also means that I spend time talking to people like gun violence survivors for whom guns have often destroyed any ability to take everyday life for granted. Yes, I have met that quintessential American gun owner, the white conservative guy who owns a few guns, but I've also met enough people who break that mold or push back or play along its edges to know that we've got to think beyond it if we are going to have a better gun debate. People like Jason, a pseudonym for an African-American gun carrier that I met in Detroit. Jason started carrying a gun because he wanted to exercise outside in his city and be safe as he did so. Eventually opting to openly carry a gun, he realized that his gun didn't just make him feel safer, it also made him a role model, as he saw it, for the teenage boys who were too young to legally carry a gun themselves, but old enough to know that a black man who openly and legally carries a gun is engaging in a civic practice, gun rights, that is often seen as off limits to men of color. Keep a clean record, his message to them was, and one day you can do this too. Or people like Zeke, the pseudonym for a white gun seller that I met in 2020. Zeke did not hesitate to, <laughs> to identify as conservative when I asked him what his politics were. We talked as pandemic uncertainties, civil unrest, and democratic instabilities drove gun sales up across the US. And he didn't differ much from his fellow conservatives in his attitudes on the coronavirus pandemic, Black Lives Matter, and President Donald Trump. But he was eager to tell me about what he characterized as almost a renegade opinion vis-a-vis -vis other gun sellers. He supported background checks. He wanted more comprehensive background checks. He wanted people to jump through more hoops in order to access a gun. As he told me, I'd rather put people through the ringer than have 15 kids shot. And then there was Belinda, the pseudonym for a white mother whose daughter survived a mass shooting at her school. Belinda could recount the trauma of that day because her daughter called her as it all unfolded. The screaming, the commotion, a kid yelling, he's right behind us. Within days, Belinda became politically active, joining one of the major gun violence prevention organizations. She was passionate about preventing gun violence for everyone. And she quickly understood that certain kinds of victims, like the kids at her daughter's school, garner the attention of the public and the media, whereas other victims, particularly victims of color, often never get to have their stories told. Belinda was also passionate about pushing back against the either-or terms of the gun debate. Coming from a family of gun owners, she had her own handgun, she had a concealed pistol license, and she was passionate about safe firearm storage. One of her favorite aspects of her advocacy work was showing people you could break the stereotypes. Now, these three people stick out, but there were many more who challenged the terms of the gun debate in a variety of ways, whether big or small. For people who owned and carried guns, engaging with firearms was often as much about practicalities as it was about politics, worries about surging crime rates, concerns about police response times, 
fears amid a high-profile act of gun violence. Now, such concerns are often embedded in a broader crisis of trust that not always, but often transcends partisan lines. Over the past several decades, Americans have exhibited plummeting confidence in a variety of social and political institutions and across various branches of government. So when stuck between a rock and a hard place, Americans often reach for a gun. Maybe because that's their preferred tool, or maybe it's because that's the only tool they see as at their disposal. This is exactly what happened in 2020, when gun sales surged even beyond what happened in 2008, as Americans searched for certainty and, in, and security amid so-called unprecedented times. And the people buying guns were often not the typical gun owner. Women, racialized minorities, members of the LGBTQ community, and liberals were all buying firearms in noticeably larger numbers, diversifying American gun culture and possibly setting the stage to push back against the either-or terms of the gun debate. So consider this. The vast majority of Americans want universal background checks. And the vast majority of Americans oppose a ban on handguns. So let's put those two figures together. Even though the gun debate is typically presented as a debate between people who want to completely restrict gun access and people who want to completely deregulate gun access, those two figures next to each other suggest that Americans aren't either or on the gun debate, but they might be both and. So while the terms of the gun debate suggest that Americans can't have it both ways, that may actually be what Americans want. Now, don't get me wrong. I want to be very, very clear on this. Partisanship and political division absolutely matter to understanding guns in America. I write a great deal about partisanship in my own research. So I don't want to deny that. I don't want to downplay it. You cannot understand the story of guns in America without understanding the story of our political divides. But too often, partisanship ends the conversation rather than providing the starting point for new questions and new curiosities about guns, but also about ourselves. It is partisan stereotypes that transform the gun debate into an us versus them struggle between gun-grabbing Democrats and trigger-happy Republicans. Partisanship makes it impossible to see the more complicated place of guns in American life. It also makes it impossible for us to see each other. As fellow humans, as fellow citizens, as friends, family, fathers and daughters, if you will. And it makes it incredibly difficult to see the choice that we all have. To see our political differences as the fuel to help us achieve our mutual goals or as a gulf that irrevocably divides us. Breaking up with partisanship, refusing to let our political differences divide us, allows us to see each other, but also ourselves as the complicated, contradictory, and messy people that we are, or could become. So back to my dad. My dad, the consummate conservative, always wanted me to follow his path into business. I always assumed that he was deeply disappointed that instead I became a university professor and a sociologist at that. Not exactly the top choice for an ultra-conservative dad. And still, he supported me on a path that I assume he would have never chosen for himself, an assumption that was based on the partisan blinders that I grew up with as a kid. He passed away in 2019, but not before letting my family know that his path could have been different as well. After being diagnosed with ALS, he often talked about how he wished he would have become a social worker. It turns out that partisanship didn't just define him, it also defined me and the way I saw him. When we let go of partisanship, 
we might be surprised at what we see in each other, but also in ourselves. It was at that moment that I realized the power that we all have to start a new kind of conversation if only we looked at each other as open questions rather than as foregone conclusions. Thank you.